All right, welcome to Questions and Answers with the Doc. Uh, that's me, Dr. John Edwards. My friends call me Doc. Um, got some really interesting things going on tonight. A couple special pregnancy cases. I've been noticing that with some of the patients I've been talking with, I've been starting to put a couple things together that really seems um, really seems to help us give some insight into how the nerve system and how the pelvis um, are working during pregnancy and I wanted to share some of those insights with you guys tonight. Uh, second thing we're going to be talking about is we've had uh, a lot of kids lately that have had fevers and helping the parents understand a little bit more about the process of why the body has fevers, what to do when your kid has a fever, and almost a, a little more of the insight into why the body does fevers in the first place. Why is that even something that the human body does? I think that why is really key to understanding the what to do part. Um, the last thing we want to talk about tonight is something we've been discussing the uh, last weekend in our Pathways Connect gathering here in the Southwest Florida area. Um, it's the cultural creatives movement. And cultural creatives have a combination of an inner journey and an outward worldview um, that really makes them feel unique because they don't see it reflected in outer media. But because of that, they hold a lot of that stuff in. So they tend not to make the connections that they need to. And one of the goals that we have for our local group is to help connect families, parents, individuals who feel like they're on a, a very specific journey with their health and their lives and how they travel through the world and help them interconnect with the other people in their community that feel the same way they do too. So two of those things, the, both the fevers and the cultural creatives work are featured in our latest issue of Pathways to Family Wellness. That's this guy right here. If you haven't gotten a copy of Pathways and you want to, um, go ahead and check out pathways to family wellness.org, I think it is. Um, also, look up the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association. You can find uh, Pathways Connect. There's a little PC logo next to the chiropractor's offices who are involved with Pathways Connect. If you're local to the Cape Coral Fort Myers area, you can come down to Baby Love Birth Center slash Mom's Chiropractic Clinic. It's located at 3046 Del Prado Boulevard South. I always have copies there that I give away for free to uh, people in the community that want to get a copy. Uh, we try to distribute, I get about 100 of the issues and I give them out. I uh, try to distribute around the area so other places like the Skinny Pantry, uh, Mother, uh, Mother Earth, Ada's Natural Market that we're broadcasting from here. Um, uh, we'll also carry things like that. So, as always, if you have questions, Ustream just revised their whole broadcaster system to be more user friendly. Um, I'm looking right now at a, a new screen that they have for chat uh, so it can actually be inside the same viewer window so I don't have to pop it out so I don't miss any comments. So if you have questions you can come directly into that window and uh, chat away that way. Um, the other way that you can do it is I have my for those of you who are personal friends of mine on Facebook, you can post in the messages. I, it's the only time I turn it on. Otherwise, that thing's going off all the time. So you can hit me up on there, too. Um, yeah, so tonight I'm going to talk about the first thing, which is the interesting pregnancy cases we've been having. 70% um, of my practice as a chiropractor um, in family practice is working with expecting moms and children under three. It's not really typical for your general family practitioner out there, um, but it's been the focus of my practice. It's, it's what I've always wanted at, when I started Mama's Chiropractic. And part of the interesting thing that it's allowed me to do is to examine really, really closely, um, I guess, exceptions to the rule. We have a lot of 80-20 rules in our life. It's called the parietal principle, that if you take 80% of your uh, results tend to come from 20% of your efforts. Um, likewise, kind of on a negative thing, if you, have, if, if you want to look in, in business, 
80% of your complaints are only gonna come from 20% of your customers, but 80% of your sales are also gonna come from 20% of your customers. So that 80-20 rule, that Pareto principle, has been around in business for a long time. Um, as someone who practices the Webster technique, we are looking at the effectiveness of that technique for things like, let's say, baby positioning. Um, we found there was a study done with 69 pregnant women who had problems with the baby positioning, whether the babies were breech or whether they were laying across or whether they were oblique or if, um, you know, any variations of that. We found that in 69% of the cases, we were able to get those babies back into a normal position, not by doing any movement of the baby itself, but just by adjusting the pelvis and the sacrum and the nerve flow that goes in there. Um, picture it just like, if you think about the, the outlet for the pelvis as being a football, trying to push a basketball through a football-shaped opening, that's not gonna work very well. So if we can bring balance to the pelvis uh, so the structures can move, then the babies can pass through easier. Well. Our 80-20 principle comes in when we're looking at, all right, why is it that in 31% of those cases, the adjustments weren't working? And one of the opportunities that's unique to my clinic is that I'm able to see women who um, maybe don't have normal anatomy and figure out, uh, pay really close attention to the application of the technique and say, these may be the exceptions to the rule. Um, a few months ago, I noticed that when I was adjusting one of my patients, um, I would adjust the typical, um, the tailbone, the sacrum, and the check that I use is a really obvious check to anybody looking on the outside. I bring the heels up and both of the legs, one heel should touch close to the bum and the other heel probably won't get all the way there. And so that tells me that I need to adjust the tailbone on that side. Most of the time, when I bring that back up for a recheck, the tailbone has leveled out and so the heels come up to the bottom evenly. I started noticing that 20% of the time, I'll bring the heels up and instead of both coming up to the bottom, they'll both come up evenly, which is um, telling me that the, uh, that the leg that was able to come all the way up, for some reason, has now got more resistance in it but they're even, which was part of the goal. So I started looking up to the next level and saying, all right, if in our chiropractic techniques, if, if that doesn't clear out what we're looking for for our indicators, you go up to another level and say, you know, how are things moving up here? And I found that if I adjust the next segment, the most interesting thing would happen. The heels would stay even, but now they would come all the way up to the bottom. So. I started paying attention to the patients that I've had that um, this was true for. And the first one that I, that I was adjusting, she ended up having um, a longer than average labor. Um, I adjusted her uh, during her labor and her husband swears up and down that the second adjustment I did for her helped speed the labor along. Now I noticed that it didn't she ended up having back labor with it, which isn't really common with patients that I've seen so far. Uh, I've been tracking through 17 pregnancies since the end of January, um, and what we're, we, you know, we ask them, how'd your delivery go? Um, this is one of the few cases where we've had back labor during it. Uh, the midwife who was attending the delivery used a saline solution, uh, it's called prolotherapy, uh, in some acupuncture points down through her sacrum, and that did a great job at relieving her, her back pain. Uh, had a baby come out shortly after, but it was it was a longer delivery than I had expected, and she had experienced um, back pain before. It was one of the reasons she'd been in her chiropractic care previously, not with me, but with another chiropractor. And so I was really curious to see what her pelvis looked like. And when we got the X-rays done, because uh, she was still having a little bit of low back pain after the delivery, we noticed something really interesting: is that most people will have five bones in their lumbar spine, uh, five lumbar vertebra, and she actually um, had six. What happened when she was being developed inside her mom is that the segments in her sacrum that fused to make one big triangle, the top one made a decision that it wasn't going to be part of that triangle. It was going to be its own independent vertebra, almost. See, 
it sent a little branch out where these little wings come in for the lumbar vertebra, and that little branch um, made, a, made a, a kind of joint to stabilize that vertebra in with the pelvis. So she had different pelvis mechanics um, than you would normally expect. So that really has me thinking now. As I'm looking at, um, at the technique that we're doing, is, is part of the reason why Webster hasn't been successful in those 30% those of you know, positioning cases is that reflecting um, that we have some different anatomy going on in the mom. It's something that we can't necessarily pick up on x-ray because we aren't going to x-ray a pregnant woman. But if, if I can keep close tabs on that kind of thing, um, hopefully that helps lead to a better understanding not only of our practice as chiropractors, but with pregnancy in general that if we know that we have women who have a history of um, different anatomy uh, down there in the pelvis of the sacrum or the lumbar spine, that that may tell us, A, it's probably a good idea to get adjusted to get things balanced, but B, um, that would be something if someone was going to have a home birth, she would want to know, right? Um, that if we've got some different anatomy down there, the midwife would, would know that, okay, our baby may have a harder time turning around because that's what the midwife was telling me. Uh, instead of presenting with a you know straight you know up and down like the head should be, she was palpating and the baby was kind of at an, at an angle, at an oblique. And so if we understood that you know that's kind of a function of, of what that anatomy is doing, then that might help us out actually during the delivery process and make that smoother. So really excited to to kind of look at that. And brought brought up an, another. Um, She's not a patient yet. Uh, hopefully she comes into the office, but I had a patient of mine say her friend is 36 weeks pregnant and she's having a lot of swelling issues. She's planning a home birth. This is her first, this is her first pregnancy. Um, she had to stop working because uh, she has a seated job and she was just so swollen in her legs, in her feet, in her hands that She's just kind of hanging out at home now, not able to exercise, so I know she's putting more pressure on that sacrum. All of these things are throwing flags to me. Remember, like I said, if you take that, you take that hole and pretend the sacrum's down here, if what you're doing for a job is sitting all day, then you're taking that sacrum and pushing it in like this. So now we've got a baby's head that's a round ball trying to get through an opening that's, you know, football shaped that's going to make a harder delivery. If you're going to decide that you want to have a home birth, I would think that you would do everything in your power to make sure that um, we have good position for your passenger um, and a nice shape for your passage, plus having the adequate power supply coming from the nerve system into those soft tissue structures of the uterus, of the uh, round ligaments, of the broad ligaments, uh, to, to keep everything contracting smoothly. We're all, you know, I can already tell you that if, you know, if we follow her pregnancy along, we're probably going to get some interesting things. Um, I haven't been able to figure out really what the difference is between some of my patients who have swelling in their legs and their feet and the ones who don't. Um, I, I'm checking some areas involved with uh, blood pressure up in the upper neck, um, trying to figure out if there's subluxations in the areas that go into the kidneys. Uh, which would also regulate the, uh, the fluid level in the body. Um, really trying to pay close attention to what the difference is between my patients who have the, um, the, the swelling in their legs and the ones who don't. I have found, um, with some help of my patients, that things like prenatal yoga are fantastic at helping to build the muscles in the legs to help pump that fluid back up. Um, a midwife that I work really closely with uh, also recommends uh, electrolyte drinks. She says specifically Gatorade. And so that may be the one, one time where I, I go, all right, you know, in your experience, Gatorade's the thing to go for. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just trust you. I personally don't like Gatorade because they put every food color um, known to cause behavioral issues into it. But, I mean, you're pregnant. You kind of eat and drink whatever you want and if, if it's going to help you out then that would be one of the cases where you know we'll go ahead and, and go with it. 
uh, because she says, listen, Powerade doesn't seem to do the same thing. Vitamin water doesn't seem to do the same thing. Coconut water doesn't seem to do the same thing. Whatever reason, the formulation that they have in there for Gatorade really seems to do the trick. So, um, yeah, we know from an outside in perspective that, that that can be something that can help. Um, but yeah, that's, it, it's, it's something else that's been kind of a vexing issue. Um, I know if we can come up with the answer for what we can do to help with the, the leg and feet swelling, we're gonna have a line from here to Rockford uh, of expecting moms getting those feet or ankles or, you know, 11 dorsals adjusted. So, um, but absolutely, if it's, if it's keeping that mom from being able to get up and get active, if it's keeping that, and so that means that she's staying on the couch or she's not working or she's had a sedentary job, we've got to get that pelvis checked. If you know any women that are in that situation and they're, you know, hoping for a natural delivery, you got to put a bug in their ear about this. Um, that, that's right, <laughs> Erica's making a buzzing sound. Um, that you've got to have everything in a line for delivery day. If you think back to you know, 100 years ago, we're squatting and bending and lifting in the field, um, more of an agrarian society, you know, we would have problems with, with positioning for babies for you know, different reasons. Um, we'd have much better rates of um, losing the mom or losing the babies than, than we do now. Uh, because we've got a pelvis that's in better shape. I mean, I, I can't advocate doulas and midwives enough for the uh, for the work that they're doing. Um, I also really do think that, that what we do uh, as practitioners of the Webster Technique, certified through the ICPA, is, is really going to be shown to be a vital um, piece of the puzzle when we're trying to figure out what can we do to help with, with safer natural deliveries. We had just had an organization here in Southwest Florida show The Business of Being Born. It's the first time I've ever seen the movie. I know it's going to come as a surprise to you uh, who know me that it was the very first time that I've ever seen the film. But um, maybe I was just saving up for a very special time in my life uh, to watch it. And it was funny because I think in 2008, absolutely a watershed film. We weren't talking about home birth uh, until Ricky Lake helped produce this documentary. Um, the, it just gave gave home birth a natural, you know, a national, worldwide even platform to start having this conversation about going back to the basics, um, because understanding that that birthing has become a uh, you know, a medical intervention, and that's not the way nature designed it. I think my take on the film was that um, part of the reasons. I guess maybe I wasn't as surprised to hear the things that I was surprised is because over the last four years, I've immersed myself in that culture. I don't think in 2008, I could really describe what a doula does. I think in 2008, I had kind of a vague idea of what a midwife was. I certainly wouldn't have perceived that there's a difference between midwives and, um, I have a friend of mine who calls them medwives, uh, that, that nurses are becoming midwives and still have a very medical aspect and mechanistic as um, perspective on birth. Um, I would have just thought that midwives are midwives. Uh, now I know that there's a difference. Every bit is uh, of a difference as there is within my own profession. So um, it was it was a great film. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it and I heard that there's a, another one coming up uh, produced by, by the same women who produced The Business of Being Born. Second, uh, second topic. I'm not getting any. Uh, I see we've got viewers out there. Hello. Just tossing out there in the chat. Mm. Got stream, social stream, chat. I'm launching the chat in another window on a pop out window. Um, Hello, world. Oh, good. All right, so that comes out. I'm not getting any alerts. I've got that up. Uh, second thing that we've got going on tonight uh, is the topic of fevers. One of my near and dear friends, Amanda, just had her son 
uh, go through a fever right as this magazine came out. Um, Pathways is published quarterly and they interviewed a, a medical doctor who, hi Carly, <laughs> um, interviewed a medical doctor who, um, oh, there we go, his name's Dr. Philip Incal, MD. Did a nice little picture of him here. Here's Dr. Incal. Called A New Attitude Toward Fevers. Uh, it's page 40 on, on Pathways to Family Wellness if you happen to have a magazine or following along at home. Um, at, as a person who sees the body uh, vitalistically, uh, that is to say that the body has this innate intelligence inside of it. It knows what it's doing when it's faced with challenges. Um, it's able to adapt and to learn and to grow based off its environment. Everything has a purpose. And even symptoms like a runny nose or a rash or um, a fever is a signal that the body is, is doing something and is, is actively trying to get rid of whatever's going on, on the inside. Um, one of the misconceptions that we've had, um, many I think, uh, the Dr. pointed it out, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, in the 19th century, in the early 1900s, 1800s, we lost a lot of kids to things like scarlet fever and um, uh, what are some of the other examples? Can I see this? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, thanks. He had a really good quote in here. Um, At the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, many children died of pneumonia, scarlet fever, or diphtheria. Today, U.S. children rarely die from any of the acute infectious or inflammatory feverish diseases that often claim their lives before 1900. That has more to do with modern progress in plumbing, sanitation, hygiene, and even literacy than with medical interventions such as vaccinations and antibiotics. Um, it's something that I know in the natural health field we've been saying for a long time, looking at things like not pooping in your water system. If you look at the, um, there's been a graph around for years that correlates the, um, the timing of the introduction of the SOC vaccine for polio um, with, with increased plumbing in rural areas. If you, uh, one of the biggest um, proponents of the SOC vaccine uh, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, FDR gave a ton of money to Joanna Salk to help the development of the vaccine. Remember why he was in a wheelchair? It's because he got polio. How to get polio? He used to go for daily swims down in the Hudson River. Um, and what did they used to dump in the Hudson River? All the sewage. All your poo, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you've ever swam a day in your life, you know that at some point in time, that water's getting into you. And um, I, I really think that, that, that there is an important correlation between being able to wash your hands and being able to flush it into a water supply that you're not ingesting. Um, it's one of those, you know, polio is something that is, is fecally tra and transmitted. The only way you get that is through ingesting it. Um, it's not a respiratory droplet vector like the other things that we vaccinate for. So, um, as Erica eats her food, mm, talking about delicious things. So, um, We've been saying, you know, at least in chiropractic for a very long time, that part of the, the rationale for um, you know, us kind of balking about the germ theory of disease is, is just the timing of things doesn't seem to line up. And when we're talking about why the body goes through a process, um, it does so for, for some really interesting reasons. One of the things about fever is, is that the, the Part of the brain that understands what temperature to raise your, your heat to is called the, the thalamus, and it's reading the um, reading the environment, uh, reading what the immune system is, is giving for feedback, and saying, okay, if we can boost the temperature to this level, then that will help the body get rid of things. Um, but 
Incow brings up some really, really cool points. Um, the first one that I thought was fascinating was there is no other time in your life that you're going through such a period of remodeling as you do when you're a little kid. When you're a little kid, uh, you're growing really, really fast, and your body has to get rid of that waste somehow. So what is one of the really smart strategies of, of tearing down to build back up? I mean, that, that period of remodeling happens in every single tissue we know of in our body. You have inside your bone cells, there are two types of cells. One are called osteoblast cells, and osteoblast cells help to make bony bridges. The second kind are called osteoclast cells. And osteoclast cells exist to break back down those bony bridges in order for the body to have the materials to start rebuilding them. What we know from, um, uh, from the pharmaceutical drugs that, that we'll give people, for women especially, for osteoporosis, is that they tend to make the body more brittle because they stop the osteoclast cells, the breaking down cells, from working properly. So you get these layers and layers of laminate brittle bone that never get to be remodeled and, and recycled through and so you're actually more prone to fractures because of certain pharmaceuticals uh, that are designed to help you keep from breaking your bones with osteoporosis. It's one of the biggest ironies about some of those um, uh, medical interventions is that the very thing that they're designed to treat, actually it makes worse because it's stopping the remodeling process. The, um, uh, we know that the stomach lining goes through this process, that the mucosal layer on the inside of your stomach is recycling itself every five minutes. Bone cells do it every six to nine months, uh, up to seven years. They say, you're made of totally different materials than you were you know, the seven years prior, which it blows your mind. I mean, if you look at yourself, you just look at yourself in the mirror, you pretend like you have x-ray vision so you can see all the layers of all the things that you are, that is made of totally different things than it was seven years ago. Seven years from now, you are going to lose every single molecule that you're seeing in front of you. They're all going to go away. Why? Because you eat, and you are what you eat. You take in things that makes new you. You're constantly growing and recycling. Now, picture the growth rate from, from the time that you're born to the time that you're seven. Think of how many times over your body is going through that turnover process. If you didn't have the ability to burn that stuff up and shed it and get it out of your system, then think of all the, the decayed matter that you'd be lugging around with you, right? So. From a vitalistic perspective, you are supposed to go through these developmental milestones. And in fact, if you don't go through those developmental milestones, you're going to end up missing those windows. Um, there's a researcher in New Zealand, he was a pediatrician, that used to give, uh, I love telling this story, used to give the little kids that were coming in with measles um, a really simple uh, task. He'd say, okay, I would love if you would draw a picture of a house for me. And so you would get back your typical five-year-old picture of a house. What does that look like? You've got a square box, right? That's the body of the house. You have a triangle roof. You might have a chimney. Um, maybe you have a little front door. Yeah, windows. Um, you know, your, your very, very basic picture of a house. After the children had gone through the disease process of measles, what does that look like? You've got a high fever. You've got a rash. Um, after they've gone through that, he would say, okay, what I'd really like for you to do for me, five days later, draw me another picture of a house. And there were items that started appearing that hadn't even occurred to those kids in the five days prior. It wasn't like they were sitting there and they were getting coaching on, oh, you know what you need to add? Um, these things were starting to show up. You might have a chimney and maybe a little bit of smoke coming out of the chimney. If they had windows, you would have little sashes in the curtains, cross hatches in for the windows, maybe a doorknob on the door a fence that was going on the outside and little tufts of grass. We would start adding in birds and clouds and suns. Maybe little families would, would show up in there. Um, but, but items that, that didn't, even, didn't even occur in their consciousness to start adding in uh, started happening because they went through this process. That's what his research said. Really lines up well with some of the Montessori research that we're reading. Um, that we all have these developmental windows and that if you take the body's um, body's journey from a vitalistic perspective, it's intelligent and it knows what it's doing and it's trying to grow and, uh, to grow and develop, then the body's able to get to these new levels because it gets sick. The second really interesting thing that I read uh, that Incow wrote had to do with the, the little, um, 
I don't have a better word for it. There's a fear and a panic when it comes to um, when it comes to having your kid get a fever that's really high, and I'd really like to address that. I, I think Incow does it beautifully. When it comes to it being your kid, you don't want to experiment anymore. Um, you don't have the luxury of seeing 50 kids go through this very same thing and rock through it just fine, right? This is your child. I mean, especially for moms, when you gave birth to this baby, there was a connection that was made that is as strong as heroin um, that, that absolutely made you addicted to that child and you're, you're afraid of death that you're going to lose it, right? Um, so when you start seeing that number, you know, the, start creeping up the thermometer, 103, 104, 105, we're, we get so tied into to the numbers that we forget to look at the child. And a lot of the old school pediatricians will tell you this, Incow says it in here, I've been saying it for years. Um, if you get away from, from doing the measuring and instead you use your powers of observation with the children, there's some very, very specific things that a kid will tell you if they're okay or if they're not. Um, they should get rosy, they should get red, you should keep them warm. Um, I always advocate a nice warm bath, a little bit of lavender oil on the feet. Um, you put on some wet cotton socks and some warm wool socks on top. Um, that helps wick the heat out of the body. Wool, oddly enough, is the only natural fiber that actually warms as it gets wet. That's why it makes such a great base layer for people up north when, during the winter time, because uh, you can sweat in it and it actually makes you warmer. Um, but that drawing the heat out is exactly what the body needs. It, it needs to be encouraged that way. Um, one of the reasons that, or that, 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 as you keep on tracking that, that number, kids will, will give you very obvious signs when it's time to go to the doctor. Um, you start offering them food and water, they're not interested. Uh, they start to get lethargic. They aren't making eye contact with you. They're getting listless. Those kinds of things are, okay, now we're getting neurology involved. Now it's time to go. But if you're looking at that number, and it's going 104, 105, and they're interacting okay with you, um, they're grumpy and they're fussy, but you know, you say, would well, you want a drink? And they're like, mm, um, you know, at that point, we're still okay because we're still having conscious awareness. The body's doing its thing. And here's the really brilliant point, I think, and Cal points out. Um, The children, this is a quote from him, children usually don't have severe aches and pains with their fevers that adults suffer. We seem to worry that our, our kids are suffering with the fever. Um, they seem to intuitively know that it's a healing process, that it's something that they need. Um, but they, they usually don't have severe aches and pains with their fevers that adults suffer because children's bodies are less dense and hardened than adults' bodies and offer less resistance to the fever surge of warmth flowing through them. I see that all the time. When I'm starting to explain to parents why it's so much easier to adjust little kids than it is to adjust an adult, it's because we've got years and years and years of decay and buildup on the insides of our bodies, scar tissue that hasn't been able to get reborn. Um, when you have a little kid and they're having that fever, they're able to take that bigger surge, that higher temperature, with less resistance than we are as adults. If we start getting up there, we've got so much you know, decay and matter if you're not regularly detoxing your body. And so your, your temperature doesn't have to go up as high and boom, suddenly you have a problem. The, uh, the thing that I really love that he was saying about this is it also had to do with, with, with the big fear, right? Febrile seizures, fever-induced seizures. He said, typically what they'll find in the research with kids who have come in with the kinds of uh, fever-induced seizures is that it was a really rapid shift up in, in the temperature. That the body wasn't allowed to, um, there was some sort of resistance going on. That the, the arms weren't able to warm, the legs weren't able to warm. That it went straight from the core and fought and fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And then, bam, finally was able to break up. Um, he said there was no, oh, it, Clapping. <laughs> Sorry for the minor earthquake there. Um, <laughs> we just had hot seaweed uh, uh, chips, and Eric was clapping because they were spicy. Uh, seaweed, yeah, Annie Chun's wasabi ones. Do you want some water? Speaking of, speaking of heat. <laughs> um, 
if if the body is is able to to naturally progress, you know, you're able to keep your kid warm. Um, even if the child does have a fever, there's no correlation between having a having a fever once and ever having one again. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between uh, temperature of a fever and having that fever. That a lot of fevers happen at a lower rate than that 105. Um, just really gave some some interesting insight to the, the to the relationship between having um, your body get that heat and whether or not that's important for, for having any kind of brain issue, which is the big thing that you worry about. So just to reiterate again, fevers are okay. Um, they're, they're part of the body's natural ability to get through um, the, the rebuilding process. And, oh, I'm starting to slow down. Um, part of the, the body's ability to get through the natural rebuilding process. And um, I know it's tough. You can have your, your backups on hand, um, but if, a, if your kid's starting to get warm and you're doing the mom thermometer thing, I really think that is the best way to, um, to keep track of, of how your child's doing. Um, get off the thermometer so much. Last thing we want to talk about tonight is, I don't know about you guys, but synchronicity, when that stuff happens, one of my favorite things in the universe. I love being able to meet up with a group of people and know that there was a reason that we were all supposed to get together. Um, since, since Erica and I came down to this area, one of the reasons we know that we're you know, essentially destined to be here is because we continuously have events come to us that show us, yep, you're in the right place at the right time. One of those things has been what's happened with our Pathways Connect group. Pathways Connect is a parent education resource um, for communities. And what we've been trying to do with, with our chapter is to you know, not only reach out to our patients and through the Facebook community, um, but we're also trying to build it into a broader, um, really think that the purpose for, for the parent education isn't to preach to the choir. I really feel like the, the purpose is to reach those parents who don't really know yet that um, that we even exist, that there's other options besides um, doing the route that, that TV tells them they should be doing with their kids. And uh, that's really where I think we're going to make our strongest impact. So I was so, so, so happy to find um, a couple weeks ago there were a group of moms who were getting together to try to make a series of seminars about things like attachment parenting, about cloth diapering, about baby led weaning. And I was reading some of the values in the emails about um, who these women were and what they were trying to accomplish. And this whole time I'm going, you guys really, really sync up well with what I'm trying to do here too with Pathways and what Pathways is trying to do internationally. So I introduced, um, uh, you know, kind of gave my proposal to, to help out and man, did it connect. Um, Your pathway's connected? My pathway's connected. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> That's good. Um, the next meeting that we ended up having, um, we ended up having the deepest, uh, again, connections. The most intimate feeling, you know, sharing. We were talking at the time about how we were parented, uh, parenting the way that we were parented, honoring the... Um, you know, as men, honoring what our dads did, but what we would choose to do differently. And there was a dad, he had a two-week baby, two-week-old baby in his arms, and he shared that, you know, he and his dad always had a really good relationship, uh, but his dad worked a lot. And during the time that he was, um, that his wife was pregnant, um, he and his dad really explored more about their relationship. And man, he got choked up, and everybody around that table, you know, was just like, yep. You know, nobody could talk. It was such a touching moment. Um, those kinds of things, I think, don't happen until you get to a tipping point of energy. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about, yeah, they don't happen online, they don't happen in chat rooms. Um, they really happen when, when people get together and share that space. Part of that philosophy of having uh, an inner work and 
um, you know, having an outer world view, an outer world action, is part of the definition of, of the cultural creatives. Um, cultural creatives, if again, if you're following along in your pathways guide, we're on page six. This is Lisa Reagan's article um, in, in the section called The Conscious Path, following the hero's call to adventure. Um, she starts off talking about Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, for those of you who are Star Wars fans, George Lucas uh, says that this is part of the influence behind the story in Star Wars. Um, the, uh, another one is The uh, Seven Samurais, which is a Japanese movie. Um, but she, um, she talks about um, social scientist Paul H. Ray and Sherry Ruth Anderson in their research-based book, The Cultural Creatives, How 50 Million People Are Changing the World. I was introduced to cultural creatives through a book by uh, a woman named Joan Borshenko. It's called a, a Woman's Journey to God, and through a book club that I was involved in, and um, really was a, an interesting. I, like I, I got the, the the two bits, the the the, the inner work and the uh, the outer journey, um, but the piece that I didn't get, that's essentially the definition of cultural creatives, is that we always feel alone with this. We feel like we're the only people who feel this way. Yeah, we, we feel like when we finally find somebody out there that feels the same way we do, we're like, oh my God, you're one in a million. You get me. <laughs> you understand. You have those same values. And it's such a magnetism. Part of the brilliance in, in Reagan's article and, and Ray's work is that um, there are millions of us out there. And we aren't recognizing it because it's not reflected in the media. When we're looking for those those outward reflections of, you know, are we weirdos? Are we really alone with this? They just don't exist out in the in the media. It's it's not a value structure that's reflected. So we feel like we're by ourselves. And the only way that we're finding that connection is is occasionally we're getting together in you know coffee shops. We're getting together at bars. or uh, we're in college, or we're, we're, we're meeting and we're sharing books, and we're like, oh my goodness, this is such such a special small group of people. I hope that I'm ever going to find other people out there that, are, that think it like we do. Well, Eric and I go down today, um, down at Bonita Springs, to meet with a, a gentleman named uh, Sayer G. And Sayer writes a, a blog called GreenMedInfo.com. And GreenMedInfo turns out to be the uh, almost essentially the same blog that I was writing a couple of years ago, researching. Um, I, I, w I had a blog called GrillHealthReport.com. Uh, I was doing video podcasting with it, and I was doing research uh, from a from a holistic practitioner perspective. I was reading the scientific literature and helping distribute that to reception areas for chiropractors, acupuncturists, homeopaths, and naturopaths. And Sayer's doing the same exact thing. Um, in fact, he's doing it on a bigger scale than I was. And I had no idea he even existed until I came down here. Here we are, um, I walk into the store that he's managing, call it for goodness sake, and um, Sayer says the funniest thing to me. I'm, I'm, wearing a, like, I'm wearing a tank top and shorts and my sandals. And Sayer says, oh, you look a lot younger than I thought you were going to. And the second thing he said was, man, I actually dressed up. He was wearing a, a collared, like, you know, like a shirt, like I, what I'm wearing right now. He's like, I actually dressed up for you because I figured that you were like this old guy and I needed to be, you know, a different way. I need to be proper for you. Uh, usually I'm in tie dye and, and hippie clothes. And we laughed about that because we started sharing just, I think cultural creators have a way of testing each other out. Um, we'll drop something like, uh, what's your sign? And, and not in a cheesy way but in a way that helps us understand each other. Um, we were talking about all kinds of things that, you know, as we started testing the waters a little bit, uh, talking about vaccination, talking about, you know, chemtrails, and talking about, um, I don't know, we just, uh, you know, different alternative therapies for cancer and, and that, you know, the medical industry, you know, I know I've got a friend of mine who's, who's an oncology nurse, um, says that, you know, if, if she would share the things that she knew about cancer, 
in her hospital, she wouldn't have a job anymore. Um, because you know, the way that they're attacking with a militant attitude is actually counterproductive. Um, just the, the brilliant ways that we were inter interconnecting gave us that, that feeling of, holy mackerel, we're the, we have the same values. So Sayer and I spend you know, maybe seven minutes together before he introduces me to another chiropractor who um, happens to be in a, you know, happens to be in there for lunch. And he is part of a, a, a group in chiropractic practice that, um, I don't know, it kind of has a, a turnkey franchise model for, for what we do as chiropractors. Um, turns out he's, he's the, the keynote speaker and the MC for, uh, for their seminars up in Orlando. And Sayer is going to be talking at, at their seminars. Um, I had just gotten adjusted earlier this morning by another member of that practice structure. Um, and yeah, I thought that was, that was a really interesting connection. I get off the phone with, um, you know, a couple hours later with, with Lisa Reagan, who wrote this article, because when I was talking to her about being able to do a big event down here, and mentions what I had just been spending the last two hours doing, and she says, oh, you know Sayer? I use Sayer's articles all the time <laughs> for Green Med Info, uh, for something she does for Kindred. So we had this whole cycle just in the last 24 hours, just in the last six hours, of, of all these connections that are being built, reinforcing that we're on the right path. And I really do think that, that when you find, when, when you follow, you know, your, you get really clear on your values. You get really clear on living in integrity with those values. But you start to attract the people and the situations and scenarios that allow you to do your life's work. Um, I was listening to a podcast that I love called Sound Opinions, and um, there's an artist who is surrounded by, um, by music, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, a lot of these uh, kind of funk and, and um, rock guys. And as a producer of music, uh, he wasn't really happy. He wanted to be his own artist. And he grew up in a culture that said, if you follow your passion and you're really clear on it, you will have people provide for you. And I mean, what a message for today. That was, that was exactly the message that we got, that if we align ourselves with, um, with our values and in harmony with our inner work and our outer world, um, everything starts to come together. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm glad that I'm recording this one tonight uh, because I know that, there's a, that, that I want to get that message out to more and more people. Um, Find your community out there. It, you know, I guess the, the most important thing is when you have the opportunity for those water cooler conversations about things like pregnancy. If you have a friend who's going through the things like we mentioned, um, you know, don't be afraid to say something. If your child has a fever, don't be afraid to ask somebody else what's been your experience with this, because what we're finding more and more is that there's a community that's building right now that is going to start reaching a critical mass. And when that critical mass starts to get reached, we hit this tipping point where we start really making a massive shift in the way the world's going to work. Um, we're the people who aren't the pessimists about things like global warming. Yeah, we understand the science behind what's happening, but we're not worried because we're confident that we're able to come up with solutions. Um, we're the innovators in our society. We're the people that we've been waiting for, goes, goes the Native American quote. And um, the important part is to realize that you're not by yourself, that um, you're not alone out there, and that you have to have the courage to just look across the table at somebody and say, this might sound a little strange, but this is how I feel about this and have the intestinal fortitude to be able to listen to their response too. Because believe it or not, they're in your shoes also. So thank you very much for uh, coming in tonight for question and answers with Doc. Next week, we're gonna be here at Ada's doing our, um, our five talks with the Doc. 
Uh, it's our, our fifth one. It's one I get really excited about, um, especially as a chiropractor, especially as a healthcare practitioner, because we talk about um, low risk um, therapeutics versus high risk interventions. Uh, when we have these, these conversations that we're talking about in our healthcare system, uh, the questions that we're having about you know, vitalism, about uh, looking at the body as, as a whole and treating it as a system and what our rights are as patients and, and our role as a doctor-patient relationship and what are the low risk things that we can choose for our health to help build like eating organic and exercising and meditating and getting adjusted, uh, doing acupuncture, you know, looking at herbs, allowing the body to work the way it's going to work. And so it's, it's by far one of the ones I get the most fired up about. Uh, so we're going to be recording that one, putting that up on YouTube, on our channel. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and hit me up, uh, Mama's Chiropractic on Facebook. Uh, go ahead and like our page, uh, like our channel here on Ustream. Tell your friends. Uh, the more people that we have viewing, the more questions we can field, the more people we can help. So thank you very much. I hope you have a good evening. Enjoy your weekend. Take care of each other out there.